Bruff Scott joins me to look back at probably the greatest of the lot, Bruff, or so close to your heart, in Arkell. Explain to us what made him so special. Uh, both his ability and his place in Anglo-Irish history. Two different but very complementary things at the time. Uh, his ability, he was the best, uh, everything, like all sort of sportsmen and uh, athletes, um, you can't quite compare one year to another, but he was by far the most superior three mile chaser of his own, amongst his own generation that, was, that there's ever been, that ever will be. I mean, he was giving two stone away in handicaps. His average weight in all the handicaps, he ran around 16 handicaps, was 12 stone four. I mean, he, he won the Irish Grand National with 12 stone seven. I mean, he won well, the Hennessy with 12 stone. I mean, he was, he, he was a, an unbelievable athlete and he became very um, physically interesting to look at. He, he was different walking around the paddock. He had a very high, very high head and he had very long ears. You could see him above the crowd. Uh, and he difficult. He ran almost half his races in England. He ran fifteen times in England, uh, and he had a huge, huge following. But his ability was the one thing. But the other thing is that nineteen. He won his first one in in uh, his first chase was actually which I was there and watched. It was in sixty two. He won at the sixty three festival and then sixty four, sixty five, sixty six. But at that time, Ireland was a long, long way short of the Celtic Tiger. Ireland was a, a, a pretty impoverished place, a place yearning to get forwards. He had pretty little to celebrate. And in Arkell, it had something that was better than anyone else. And it became, you know, he's really established in Irish folklore. And of course, as you know, and we, we know going into Cheltenham, part of Cheltenham's attraction is it's an Anglo-Irish celebration of spring isn't it it's an anglo-irish event and it had been that the english had been very much the dominant um part of it but then after the war you started having vincent o'brien and all that the street champion herd was running three gold cups running and ireland could do something better than england or could challenge england and then they produced you know if you, if you follow jump racing the big thing is the gold cup you know, a steeplechaser, three mile steeplechaser, they produce the ultimate three mile steeplechaser. And by the way, they, the same stable, very small stable, only 30 horses, produce another horse virtually as good, probably better over a shorter distance with flying boat, which is quite extraordinary. But Ireland could do it and it gave them something to celebrate. And, you know, it was a, it was a very precious time. I mean, obviously, I'm very involved with horse sit with Ireland. and but I also have history. I know the other side of things from the British point of view. And it was an absolute agony to be, you know, to go to Belfast and things like that and go to the South. And with the, with the racing passport, I could cross the border and I could be in really bad places and people would accept me, but, and I would know it was a bad place. But, uh, you know, to, to know there was that hostility, but the racing was a passport was a wonderful thing. And Ar Ar Arco personified the link and it was a wonderful thing. So he had a huge stature off the race course, as you beautifully described there, Braff. And you mentioned a couple of his performances with huge weights, but also his gold cups. If, if you had to put your finger on his best or maybe career defining performance, what would it be? It had to be that cold, clear day in uh, March 1964, when Milhouse, who'd won the gold cup the year before and was, funny enough, he was an ex-Irish horse, but... He was trained by our top trainer, um, Fulk Warwin, who was a person who was, you know, he was Nicky Henderson of his day. Though he, as I said, nowadays they have 200 horses, he had 50. But he was a sort of big trainer. And Milhouse was his, the best horse he's ever had, he felt. And he won the Gold Cup the year before, really impressive. He was a magnificent, great, big, massive horse and fantastic jumper. And we heard about Arkell, he came, he won his first race in November 62. I remember being there at Cheltenham. Then he won the Broadway, not the, he won the, um, the, the it was called the Broadway Novice, the, the Novice Chase at, um, at uh, 
Cheltenham at the festival very, very easily. And everyone was saying how unbeatable he was. And he came to run against Milhouse in the Hennessy handicap. And it was a very foggy day because we didn't have nearly good television as now. And they were sort of reasonably close turning in. And then uh, Milhouse seemed to take an advantage. Arkell ran on to be fourth. Uh, and um, uh, so we said, well, let's bubble burst. Uh, there was a story going round afterwards that oh, Arkell had slipped and he'd be better next time. He then bolted in, uh, in Ireland and the Irish said, no, no, he'll beat you. Because we didn't believe that. We just said they, they would say that, wouldn't they? And so, but people in Ireland were saying, look, I promise you, this is a, this is a extraterrestrial. And he had looked quite freakish when he ran at Cheltenham two times before. I mean, I, I remember very, very clearly the first time I saw him, which was his first run of offences, and people have been saying about this thing. And then he was pretty lean, really, uh, walking around the paddock with his great big ears. And in the race, which funny enough, Ian Balding, the trainer, rode in, rode a horse called Milo, which was second favourite. And I was standing at the last fence, and coming to the last, he was sort of a couple of legs clear, Arkle. And he, he, I forget who I was standing next to, but he landed in front on the, on the he landed on the run in. And then he just took off. And it was a, one of the strongest memories I have for my whole racing life. He took off, it sort of hit you in the eyes. And I turned to my friend, whoever it was, and said, what the F's that? What is it? And I've written since, you know, it was like another species. You know, perhaps he was, he was quite different. And then he absolutely bolted up the next festival. So we did think he was quite freakish, but he couldn't beat Milhouse. And then on that cold day, funnily enough, I was right. Were the press, were the press really building up to this bruv as, as the, the showdown, if you like? Yes, they were. Of course, the press was much, much. It's funny, we felt it was huge, but it was much smaller now. And Cheltenham was probably more in a bubble. On the other hand, racing was a much, much higher priority. I mean, you know, when I first became the Sunday Times racing correspondent, it was the first time they hadn't had two correspondents. And they don't have one now. You know, it's, it's, uh, it was very high priority, Cheltenham. And the, the, the an Irish challenger to the great mill house was the big thing. And we felt it very strongly within the sort of people racing fans that mill house was the best we'd ever seen. Sort of could be. You all, we always want the best ever, don't we? You know, Shishkin could be the best ever, all this sort of stuff. Uh, and, you know, and mill house has beaten him. So we know mill house is better. And then you know, the race, there were only four runners. It was extraordinary, really. And funny, Ark was pulling, if you look at it, Ark was actually pulling, pulling Pat Taft's arms out half the time. And, you know, you couldn't fault Milhouse jumped beautifully. He was still half running away, Ark coming down the hill. But then turning in, you know, when Milhouse was going to beat him, you suddenly realised, they jumped the last about together, but you suddenly realized Ark was better. And I remember looking down the stands on the run-in and thinking, I mean, he beat him very, very decisively. And I had that feeling, you know, he beat him and there are no, no excuses. And he never will again, and he never did. Uh, in fact, he, he Milhouse broke himself on the wheel of Arkell's brilliance. And he went against him time and time again. In the end, he was, was rather lovely. He did actually have his own day in the sun when he won the Whitbread under... Uh, David Nicholson, but Milhouse was broken on the wheel of, of Arkle. It was a, it was a it was an extraordinary performance. But then, you know, as we've we said as we come to the festival, to do it once is one thing, but to go on doing it and to keep coming back. And in those days, to come back with handicaps. I mean, he won the it was a, it was in sixty six. He won the he won the he won the you know, sixty five. He won the he won the Hennessy with twelve seven seven, and the week after. He ran in, which is the thing that was then called the Massey Ferguson, two and a half mile race at, at, um, uh, at Cheltenham. Uh, and he gave 31 pounds to two very good horses. Horses that really ran in gold cups and things. And he got beat a length and a length and a half. And what's more, he landed over the last and they were, they were going to beat him for the weight. He wouldn't give in. I mean, he was still grinding back. And that was... 
that was the sort of performance, you know how it is with horses that you loved him because he had a heart as well as brilliance. Uh, and of course, we all get very anthropomorphic. The Irish got completely anthropomorphic about Arkell. He was called himself and all that stuff. And, you know, he, his diet, we all knew about his diet. He had Guinness and eggs uh, and they were mixed into his food. And uh, it, it was, and Pat and Tom Draper, who funny enough, I went and I spent a summer there when I was about 16. Tom Draper was very quiet, pipe smoking farmer, quiet farmer, but educated farmer. And he, he never said very much, but he was, you know, you, he had that lovely thing, sort of twinkle eyed wisdom. Uh, and people could speel away at him, sort of like you and me asking him questions, and he'd be very quiet. Is this the best you've ever seen? And he'd sort of say very quietly, well, I don't think anyone will ever see a better that type of thing. He was, he was very, he was a lovely man, Tom Draper. So they came together and he had a rather amazing owner called the Duchess of Westminster, who was very tall. And had, she had a very deep voice, but she was very jolly. The Duchess, and when he retired, she rode him every day. You know, she rode him around the socking great Westminster estate. <laughs> <laughs> and to, just to finish with, Bruff, it, you mentioned Mr. Draper there. What about you? You've seen some great horses in your time. Is Arkell the best? He's the best three mile chase I've ever seen, no question. And he was different. Which, that's what was exciting about him. He was different, and you could see he was different. I mean, the performances told you it was different. When you looked at him, he looked different. He was just, it's very, you look at the pictures, he had very, very tall ears. But he wasn't actually particularly, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't as perfectly made as Sprinter Sacre, for instance, or Best Mate. Best Mate was probably the most perfect made of those three mile chasers. But he had immense athleticism uh, and, and tremendous desire to win. That's why he was always running away with Pat Taff. It was a, I was so, so lucky. And you know, I, I rode in the race after Arkell. I can't really, as you know, you look at videos, you're not quite sure what you remember, what you don't. But I do remember watching the race very clearly. And I remember sort of going into the weighing room, but I don't really remember, I've sort of tried to pretend I do, uh, Pat Taff and Willie Robinson sitting side by side afterwards, but I must have been in there. And then it just shows how old I am because in the race, my first ever ride at the festival, I jumped the second last, I finished fourth. I finished upside in front with Tom Scudamore, who's now a senior jockey's age, about 38, Tom Scudamore's grandfather. <laughs> and I'm a lucky chap, a very lucky chap. Wonderful. Bruff, thank you so much for taking us down memory lane with the great Arkle. It's a pleasure.